Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning at First Christian Church of McKinney. Whether you're worshiping with us here in the sanctuary or you've brought our worship home with you on YouTube, we are so thankful to start this week off together with you. There's so many things that we can thank God for, and it is so great to have a community to praise God with this morning. A couple of announcements before we get started. I was informed that there's 10 days until school starts. I don't know if that's a, a, a sigh of relief for you or not, but next week we are having blessing of the backpacks, whether you're a teacher, a student, an administrator, whoever you are, if you have anything to do with the education system, we invite you to bring your backpack, your uh, school bag, your lunchbox for a blessing of those, not only those backpacks, but of those uh, people who help educate uh, educate everyone around us, of course. Um, also, on Saturday, August 13th, the North Texas Area Women's Group is having a tea here at First Christian Church. We're the hosts. So if you want to be uh, an attendance to that, you're, of course, welcome. And you can RSVP to Sharon Gocher uh, for more information there is in your bulletin. To begin our worship together, I invite you to stand and join me in a unison prayer. Dear Lord of life, we are before you in gratitude. Take all that we have and all that we are to be reformed, remade, and renewed. Use every tangible gift we possess for the blessing of the world around us. We long for our lives to serve your children in justice and joy. May the life of Christ make every aspect of our lives anew. In the name of the risen Lord, we pray. Amen.
is the praise that we bring to you this day, God, that is filled with gladness. Even from the depths of sorrows or concerns or unanswered questions, even from the ho-hum of what seems like average life, from wherever it is that we have journeyed to be in this place and time to worship today, we worship you with full and glad hearts, praising that you, the Almighty One, have been what we need, have been our provision. You stoke the flames of goodness, warming our soul, illuminating our pathways, and giving to us a sense that we are not alone or orphaned or abandoned. To you, God, we belong. In Christ we have found life now and eternal, peace and forgiveness of sin. And so it is in the words of Jesus that we share, that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As you're finding your seat, I invite the children up front for children's moment with me. There was a friend that lit our candle. If he comes, if not, we might. <laughs> okay. Well, we offer our blessing to, to our children as they are preparing for a school ahead of them. Uh, there's a lot of things in our life that we can pray for and about and pray for our community. And there is inside your bulletin a list of names that have been requested. If you ever have any prayer requests that you want to add to that list, you can submit it on our website for our prayer group or for your pastoral staff or for your elders. Let us go to God in prayer. O oh, gracious and eternal God, we acknowledge you this morning, we recognize you this morning, and we admire you this morning. We know that you are in our lives through the sunshine, through anticipated rain, and through so much more. Remind us of your presence in our lives. Remind us of the ways of which you touch us, the ways that you bring a comfort and a peace and love and grace like no other. We lift up to you the anxieties and disappointments that we carry on our hearts, the anxieties of a new school year, the disappointments of chapters ending, the disappointments of diagnoses, and so much more. We know that you are the one that is there for us. We know that you forgive us. Remind us of the ways in which you are there for us when we misstep and we find ourselves off the path that you have called us to be. We know it is you, O oh God, who is there for us, who cares for us, and the reason that we gather as one this morning, the reason that we know that you are here with us, the reason we share our possessions, we share our energy, and we share our excitement for you. Guide us, O oh God, teach us your ways. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thank you. Good morning, church family. It is good to be with you today. Um, and the fact that I am here with you today should tell you something. The virtue of my presence in worship this morning is a clear signal that I did not win 1.3 something billion dollars in the mega millions drawing over the weekend. Because as much as I love you, 
Reverend Wright would be at the ready. <laughs> I'll check in around the holidays. It'll, it would have been good to, good to see everybody. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the newest billionaire in the world. Um, and so we're, I guess we're going to keep coming to work. We're going to come keep doing life together. Um, and I promised the first service that like, if I won a billion dollars and disappeared immediately, you know, because of my new found stardom and fame, um, that I would like, I, I would, I would create some sort of endowed fund to like permanently fund the senior pastor for the church so that the, the next person is taken care of. And you, okay. But those are my promises to you. Um, I don't, really play, so it's very difficult for me to win, but it does mean that I'm here with you this morning. But it's pertinent, that question of what do you do if you hit it rich, as it relates to the scripture that we're going to read this morning from the 12th chapter of Luke. Uh, It starts out as sort of a family fight that Jesus has been invited into, and like any wise pastor, Jesus says, I prefer not to be a part of that. But let's look at what's going on deeper here and not just your family dynamics. And he offers a story about how we relate to the things that we've accumulated and and how we relate to God. Chapter 12 of the Gospel of Luke, verse 13. We'll start there. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, friend, who set me to be judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care, be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, well, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is to those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The stories that we tell ourselves matter a great deal. The stories that we tell, the narratives that we sort of weave in our heads, the messages that Maybe we were told from an early age that stuck somewhere deep in there. The stories that we tell ourselves, they matter. They shape us. Uh, They kind of drive our fears. Or they can move us into a place of peace. The stories that we tell ourselves can move us into places of wisdom. Or like the guy is described in the heading in your Bible this morning, the stories that we tell ourselves can move us to a place of foolishness. And maybe if your life is like mine, the stories that you tell yourself lead you on something of a zigzag back and forth between some wisdom and some foolishness. But sort of the voices, the mantras, the messaging inside our head and inside our hearts, they have impact on how we live, on how we relate to each other and certainly about how we relate to God. One of the things that I love about the ministry of Jesus is that one of the core things accomplished by the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it gives us a new story to tell ourselves. A new story to tell ourselves about ourselves, a new story to tell ourselves about each other, And most certainly, a new story has been given to us about God, about how God seeks to be revealed, about the function and purpose of God showing up on earth through the form of Jesus, about the gift of the Holy Spirit, that God is right here with us. And we need to be reminded of this story. We need this new self-story to tell ourselves to remind one another. 
And so often the stories of Jesus are him recentering people to see their circumstance in a new way. And that new way is to engage the spirit and presence of God with whatever the challenge or the excitement or the blessing might be. Jesus says, let's tell a new story here. Let's see from a slightly different angle. Now, the barn builder in today's story that Jesus tells, the barn builder is telling himself a story. In the way that he responds to the abundance of his crops, in the way that he responds to the abundance of his possessions, and figuring out what he's going to do with all of that, he tells himself a story, and that story is only about himself. Now, I get it, right? I understand the position that he's coming from. We've all kind of been in that moment where the bonus was bigger than we thought it it was going to be. We landed that next job that gave us just a little more cushion in the bank every month. The inheritance finally came in, and unlike the fellas in this morning's story, we didn't have to fight with our siblings about it. I mean, the bill to repair the car wasn't quite as astronomical as we thought. We've been in the type of position where we've surveyed sort of tangible resources of our lives and been like, oh, good, there's more there than I thought. What am I going to do with it? And I understand where he's coming from when he says, I figured it out. Because can I tell you how many times I have said to myself, I figured it out. And how many times I've actually figured it out. So I get it. He thinks he has a plan, but the plan that he has forged to tear down his barns and build bigger ones, again, not a bad plan. I hope, I hope that you've made plans for your future. I hope that someday uh, when, your, when your life needs for you to be retired or to take a break or a breather or to even go on vacation and just relax a little bit, I hope that your life allows for you to do that. Nothing wrong with bigger barns, but when he gets to the plan about building his bigger barns, the story that he's told himself to arrive at that place is only about himself. It's the same type of thing I think some of us would do if that lottery ticket did have all of the numbers on it. Or even if you've ever played that game, oh, what would we do if we won the lottery? I would have a wiener dog ranch. You can all come visit my numerous dachshunds. Um, They're going to be crossbred with lots of other cool animals, and it's going to be great, like a kangaroxen. Come check it out sometime. We give tours. There will be a bar and a restaurant. Uh, But, you know, you've played that game. And, And so often, I mean, I think of all the good we could do, right, if we came into this tons and tons of money. Uh, But I often think about like, okay, my home in the mountains, my home on the beach, my fancy new pickup, all the things that I would do for me. I tell myself the same story that's told by the man in the story that Jesus tells. So what's the new story here? Jesus offers us this new way of understanding, yes, ourselves, but also one another and God. The new story here is about how we meaningfully and actively engage God with the gifts that we have been entrusted with, with the resources present in our lives. Because what he's not doing in the story that Jesus lays out here, this farmer is not engaging the spirit and presence of God with the resources gifted to him. When we get to the 21st verse of this, of this 12th chapter of Luke, Jesus is just laid out like, hey, dog, man, you're looking at this all wrong. That's my paraphrase. You're looking at this all wrong. Like, you could die tonight, and then what happens? You've done this all wrong. And then he gets to this in the 21st verse. So it will be with anyone who stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. Now, this is not a condemnation of having anything stored up. It is a condemnation of putting all of our effort and devotion into taking care of ourselves and not meaningfully engaging the presence of God. But when he gets to that part about not being rich toward God, it's important to note here that rich is not an adjective. You know, an adjective is like it's a descriptor of like how I am. He could be rich toward God. 
A guy or a gal could be angry toward God or nervous or frustrated, bored. But in the Greek, this use of language from Jesus is not an adjective, it's a verb. This rich toward is spoken as a verb in how we are being described in our interactions and engagement with God. This comes up again, this same word only comes up twice in the New Testament. Once in this interaction that Jesus describes. And again in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, and this time it's talking about God. And it's talking about God richly blessing all of God's children. Jesus is giving a new story here, and the point is that with our riches... Our riches need to be actively engaging the spirit and presence of God. Actively calling upon God. That verb tense movement, action, motion. When we've got something valuable and meaningful, the point of that valuable, meaningful resource is that we use it to engage the spirit of God. Now, it's easy to read this story and think that it's about money, and to an extent it is, although it's not talking about money, we're talking about crops. Grain, wheat, corn, pomegranate, I don't know, it doesn't say what he grew, but he's got a bunch of that, which in turn sort of translates into a financial security. But it's also a point of envy, it's also something that gives him a position of power in life to have these resources. And so what we're talking about here is not just about what do we do with our money and how do we relate to God at the same time of taking care of the things that we're responsible for, because there's lots of other things that are valuable resources in our lives that we don't take enough time to meaningfully and actively engage God with. I mean, yes, money. But what about time? How many of us have been in that position where it feels like time has moved too quickly, the, the, the responsibilities have grown too much, there's not enough breathing space? I feel like it's just thing to do, to thing to do, to thing to do, to responsibility, to new tasks, to challenge I didn't see coming. And time just feels like it gets away from us. Well, time is a gift. There's only so much of it in a given day, and there's only so much of it that any of us get over the course of a lifetime. And it's a valuable gift. And God may not be able to slow down the passage of time, but what if we surveyed the time, the span of an hour, a day, of a lifetime, with the sense that through this gift we ought to be actively engaging the Spirit of God? And how does God help me better understand the gift of time that I've been given? You can do the same thing with opportunities for work. You can do the same thing, uh, you know, when that 15th and 30th uh, sees your bank account go, whoop, a little bit. God bless direct deposit. It's a beautiful thing. Right when that hits, um, it is a gift of money, but it's also a gift of that sense of security that we're able to take care of the obligations before us. In that moment, how are we engaging meaningfully and actively the presence of God? It's about babies, the little ones that we've been entrusted with, right? To raise and to teach and to not pull our hair out dealing with, to deal with when as though it's a surprise that we go to bed every night and get dressed and brush our teeth to go to school every morning as though we have not done this all school year. It is May. Sorry, that was some of my personal trauma. Marry a teacher, they say. They'll have all summer off and your family can do fun things. Marry a teacher and she is gone at 7 o'clock in the morning and dad gets to get the kids out the door. Nobody told you that, did they? But these little ones in our lives that we get to love and care for and try to do our very, very best for, they are an asset, they are a gift, they are a valuable, valuable resource. And how are we actively engaging the presence of God when it comes to caretaking this valuable resource? Now, here's what I love about church life. 
I love that in the craziness and chaos and joy and beauty and stress of raising up young ones, the church has gifted me with people to do that with. To have contemporaries in the trenches, to have forerunners who have been there and done that and are not jealous, but pray for us, they do. Right, to have uh, grandparents whose grandkids don't live in the area, but that grandma or that grandpa comes to vacation Bible school or teaches Sunday school to engage the faith and the joy and the life of the little ones. To know that my children have other children to learn the way of Jesus with, other parents to be blessed by, people to talk to when they don't like me when they're a teenager. That is the gift of the church. It's one of the ways that we actively right, in a verb tense, engage the spirit and presence of God with something valuable and meaningful that's been gifted to our lives. You can do the same thing with good food and beautiful weather, a day off from work you didn't see coming, a moment of peace that comes in a moment of prayer. These are valuable resources. And what Jesus is giving us here, this new story that Jesus is inviting us to tell ourselves, is that the valuable resources, whether they're valuable to everybody or just to me, however you define value, the valuable resources of your life have to be dealt with with more than just me, more than just how does this take care of me, but how do I, through this resource, actively, verb tense, engage the spirit and presence of God. We see this in the ministry of Jesus. It's at the onset of his ministry. He's not just trying to get people to follow him around. He's trying to get people to connect to God. And so when he's on the shores of Galilee and he calls out to people to follow him, the first thing he says is repent. This connection to God. When the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 comes around, he takes the loaves and fish that have been brought to him. What in the moment where everybody is hungry and perhaps hangry, in that moment these are valuable resources and he holds them before God and asks God to bless them and do something with them that the rest of us weren't going to be able to do. We see it when Jesus gathers in the upper room at the table with his disciples taking that meal that they shared and that time that they shared, a valuable resource of the discipling of these people who had been following him. And he breaks bread, and he shares cup, and he names the power of the covenant that God is forging with humanity through his life, through his work, and through their life together. The man in the story that we read this morning was telling himself a story. He had a certain mantra, a narrative, a, a way of seeing things, but it was just too limited in scope. And that is so true for every single one of us that when we're trying to solve a problem, deal with a valuable resource, figure out what to do next, figure out how to be helpful, our scope of vision is often way too narrow. And if we admit it, often way too much focused on just me. But the gift of the gospel is that it is, it is inviting us to know and to tell a new story. A story of a new life for us, a new life for us together, and a new life with God that Jesus forges. So whatever story you find yourself repeating to yourself, May it be that the power of the good news of Jesus Christ reminds you of a new story. Of your life, of your meaning and value held in the grip of God's care. A God who is waiting to just be poured into your life. May it be that we have the wisdom to turn to God in an active sense in every moment but particularly to turn to God in an active sense for the valuable things that we have been asked to take care of so that we can take care of each other. Amen.
It's the voice and invitation of Jesus that we listen for and receive when we're at the communion table. I know that you probably are wrestling with something for which there aren't quite simple, easy, clear-cut answers. I know that you are tired of dealing with certain things. I don't know what they are, but there's, there's tired going on in the world. There's sadness, and there is loneliness, and there is sin. And at this table, the body and blood of Jesus Christ are extended to us through this bread and cup as tangible reminders of the covenant that we have with God. And so we turn ourselves back into the direction of that God whose kingdom is at hand as we ready ourselves for communion and to receive these gifts. Let us breathe deep the spirit and presence of God as we come to God in song. Let us pray. All powerful Creator God, you spoke the universe into being with power beyond our ability to comprehend. You created the planet we live on, setting it in motion just the right distance from the warm light of a star, with an atmosphere and resources necessary for abundant life to thrive. And then you sent your Son to save us and to show us how you want us to live. Today at this table we come before you, humbly seeking forgiveness, help, and wisdom. Please forgive us when we seek security in your creation rather than the Creator. Please help us to remember that you are the one we should trust rather than solely in our own understanding and abilities. Please grant us the wisdom that will better guide us towards the ways you would have us to live. We ask your blessing upon this cup and this bread, simple products of grape and wheat that come from your creation, capable of bringing us life if we will accept them. Today at this table we come before you, humbly seeking forgiveness, help, and wisdom as we remember the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Gathered with his disciples, Jesus took from the table at the meal they were sharing the bread. Blessing it and he gave thanks for it, he passed it among those who were there, breaking it. Offering it around that table as his body broken. Doing the same with the cup. It was his extension to them of his blood shed. These emblems tell us the story of God at work, of the forgiveness of sin, of a new covenant between God and humanity that binds us to eternity. And so as you receive these elements of communion, take heart in the nearness of the Spirit of Christ. Receive the good news of the forgiveness of sin, of life now and eternal, and the enveloping love of God made known in Jesus.
what we are called to in the life of the church through the sharing of our resources is to band together, is to turn ourselves collectively toward God, to listen for God's voice, to do good for one another and for people in tangible ways through our, our physical outreach, to feed and clothe and shelter people, to care for people in intangible ways of the storytelling of the way of Jesus. All of the gifts that come together in the life of the church seek to do this good. And so each week as we worship, we offer the opportunity for you to, as an act of worship and faith, bring your gifts before God for the work of the church. In the back of the sanctuary, you're going to find our offering trays that we encourage you to make use of if you're here in the building for worship today. And you can also, as so many do, make use of our online giving at FCCMcKinney.org. It's through these gifts that uh, creativity flows, that opportunities to serve make themselves available as we see the resources we have to use to do good. And so it's with a spirit of gratitude that we bring these gifts to God, and with a spirit of patience, we wait to see where God reveals next to be a blessing. To ask God's blessing on these gifts, let's rise and sing our doxology. Just forgiveness. You have mine. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you that your promises are sure, that you are faithful and we can rely on you. Your word says that we will find joy in offering our time, our talents, and money to meet the needs of others. Help us to give freely, sacrificially, and cheerfully towards the work of your kingdom. May you cause the seeds that we sow to grow into well-watered, fruitful trees of life. Direct our ministry spending towards spreading the gospel and discipling your children towards spiritual growth and service. Lord, bless the works of our hands. Amen. I'm bad at this. But I was so excited and giddy, and now you'll know why. Um, I... I would like to invite uh, Brian Price to join us up here. Each week at the conclusion of the service, you'll hear something like, if you want to join the church, find me. And so Brian did. <laughs> and so uh, if you have not yet had the opportunity to meet Brian and his wife Brenda, uh, please take it. Um, and if you have had the opportunity, you know both of them to be uh, wonderful, kind-hearted folks. And Brian, uh, has been, you've been worshiping with us for almost two years. Uh, so found a space in the choir and in Sunday school. And uh, so now formalizing your membership here at First Christian Church. And we couldn't be more grateful to partner with you in the life of congregational ministry and in the way of Jesus Brian, by coming forward here today, do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ and your hope to live it out with us here in the First Christian Church McKinney family? Well, everybody say amen. amen. And everybody give this guy a handshake at the conclusion of our service. Um, we're so glad to share in this life with you and are grateful for your gifts played out in ministry here. to extend the invitation to you. If you find yourself looking for somewhere to collaborate, somewhere to uh, join in the community of faith, you, of course, are invited to be a first part of First Christian Church, and your invitation to your friends and your family matters, and it's important. And so as we go into our next song, let us reflect on our own invitation and our invitation to others.
The good news of the gospel is a good news of a new story. A new story in the way that God's love and will, God's life and abundance is unfolding before us through the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. As we call upon Jesus as Lord and Savior, that new story is spoken to us again and again and calling us to see not just in our own narrow view, but to have our eyes and hearts illumined to the blessing and power of what God is doing. May it be that voice of a new story that calls us forth until we are together again to worship. Go in peace under the Lordship of Jesus.